Chapter 14 of The Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 14 Alone in the Jungle. Tambudza, leading Tarzan of the Apes toward the camp of the Russian, moved very slowly along the winding jungle path, for she was old and her legs stiff with rheumatism. So it was that the runners dispatched by Maganwazam to warn Rokoff that the white giant was in his village, and that he would be slain that night reached the Russian's camp before Tarzan and his ancient guide had covered half the distance. The guides found the white man's camp in a turmoil. Rokoff had that morning been discovered stunned and bleeding within his tent. When he had recovered his senses and realized that Jane Clayton had escaped, his rage was boundless. Rushing about the camp with his rifle, he had sought to shoot down the native sentries who had allowed the young woman to elude their vigilance. But several of the other whites, realizing that they were already in a precarious position, owing to the numerous desertions that Rokoff's cruelty had brought about, seized and disarmed him. Then came the messengers from Maganwazam. But scarcely had they told their story, and Rokoff was preparing to depart with them for their village, when other runners, panting from their exertions of their swift flight through the jungle, rushed breathless into the firelight, crying that the white giant had escaped from Maganwazam, and was already on his way to wreak vengeance against his enemies. Instantly, confusion reigned within the encircling boma. The blacks belonging to Rokoff's safari were terror-stricken at the thought of the proximity of the white giant, who hunted through the jungle with a fierce pack of apes and panthers at his heels. Before the whites realized what had happened, the superstitious fears of the natives had sent them scurrying into the bush, their own carriers as well as the messengers from Maganwazam. But even in their haste, they had not neglected to take with them every article of value upon which they could lay their hands. Thus Rokoff and the seven white sailors found themselves deserted and robbed in the midst of a wilderness. The Russian, following his usual custom, berated his companions, laying all the blame upon their shoulders for the events which had led up to the almost hopeless condition in which they now found themselves. But the sailors were in no mood to brook his insults and his cursing. In the midst of this tirade, one of them drew a revolver and fired point-blank at the Russian. The fellow's aim was poor, but his act so terrified Rokoff that he turned and fled for his tent. As he ran, his eyes chanced to pass beyond the boma to the edge of the forest, and there he caught a glimpse of that which sent his craven heart cold with a fear that almost expunged his terror of the seven men at his back, who by this time were all firing in hate and revenge at his retreating figure. What he saw was the giant figure of an almost naked white man emerging from the bush. Darting into his tent, the Russian did not halt in his flight, but kept right on through the rear wall, taking advantage of the long slit that Jane Clayton had made the night before. The terror-stricken Muscovite scurried like a hunted rabbit through the hole that still gaped in the boma's wall at the point where his own prey had escaped, and as Tarzan approached the camp upon the opposite side, Rokoff disappeared into the jungle in the wake of Jane Clayton. As the ape-man entered the boma with old Tambudza at his elbow, the seven sailors, recognizing him, turned and fled in the opposite direction. Tarzan saw that Rokoff was not among them, and so he let them go their way. His business was with the Russian, whom he expected to find in his tent. As to the sailors, he was sure that the jungle would exact from them expiation for their villainies. Nor, doubtless, was he wrong, for his were the last white man's eyes to rest upon any of them. Finding Rokoff's tent empty, Tarzan was about to set out in search of the Russian, when Tembudza suggested to him that the departure of the white man could only have resulted from word reaching him from Maganwazam that Tarzan was in his village. He has doubtless hasted there, argued the old woman. If you would find him, let us return at once. Tarzan himself thought that this would probably prove to be the fact, and so he did not waste time in an endeavor to locate the Russian's trail, but instead set out briskly for the village of Maganwazam, leaving Tambudza to plod slowly in his wake. His one hope was that Jane was still safe and with Rokoff. If this was of the case, it would be but a matter of an hour or more before he should be able to wrest her from the Russian. He knew now that Maganwazam was treacherous, and that he might have to fight to regain possession of his wife. He wished that Mugambi, Sheeta, Akut, and the balance of the pack were with him, for he realized that single-handed it would be no child's play to bring Jane safely from the clutches of two such scoundrels as Rokoff and the wily Maganwazam. To his surprise he found no sign of either Rokoff or Jane in the village, and, as he could not trust the word of the chief, he wasted no time in futile inquiry. So sudden and unexpected had been his return, and so quickly had he vanished into the jungle after learning that those he sought were not among the Waganwazam, that old Maganwazam had no time to prevent his going. Swinging through the trees, he hastened back to the deserted camp he had so recently left, 
for here he knew was the logical place to take up the trail of Rokoff and Jane. Arrived at the boma, he circled carefully about the outside of the enclosure until, opposite a break in the thorny wall, he came to indications that something had recently passed into the jungle. His acute sense of smell told him that both of those he sought had fled from the camp in this direction, and a moment later he had taken up the trail and was following the faint spore. Far ahead of him, a terror-stricken young woman was slinking along a narrow game trail, fearful that the next moment would bring her face to face with some savage beast or equally savage man. As she ran on, hoping against hope that she had hit upon the direction that would lead her eventually to the great river, she came suddenly upon a familiar spot. At one side of the trail, beneath a giant tree, lay a little heap of loosely piled brush. To her dying day, that little spot of jungle would be indelibly impressed upon her memory. It was where Anderson had hidden her, where he had given up his life in the vain effort to save her from Rokoff. At sight of it, she recalled the rifle and ammunition that the man had thrust upon her at the last moment. Until now she had forgotten them entirely. Still clutched in her hand was the revolver she had snatched from Rokoff's belt, but that could contain at most not over six cartridges not enough to furnish her with food and protection both on the long journey to the sea. With bated breath she groped beneath the little mound, scarce daring to hope that the treasure remained where she had left it. But to her infinite relief and joy her hand came at once upon the barrel of the heavy weapon, and then upon the bandolier of cartridges. As she threw the latter about her shoulder and felt the weight of the big game gun in her hand a sudden sense of security suffused her. It was with new hope and a feeling of almost assured success that she again set forward upon her journey. That night she slept in the crotch of a tree, as Tarzan had so often told her he was accustomed to doing, and early the next morning was upon her way again. Late in the afternoon, as she was about to cross a little clearing, she was startled at the sight of a huge ape coming from the jungle upon the opposite side. The wind was blowing directly across the clearing between them, and Jane lost no time in putting herself downwind from the huge creature. Then she hid in a clump of heavy bush, and watched, holding the rifle ready for instant use. To her consternation she saw that the apes were pausing in the center of the clearing. They came together in a little knot, where they stood looking backward, as though in expectation of the coming of others of their tribe. Jane wished they would go on, for she knew that at any moment some little eddying gust of wind might carry her scent down to their nostrils, and then what would the protection of her rifle amount to in the face of those gigantic muscles and mighty fangs? Her eyes moved back and forth between the apes and the edge of the jungle toward which they were gazing, until at last she perceived the object of their halt, and the thing that they awaited. They were being stalked. Of this she was positive, as she saw the lithe, sinewy form of a panther glide noiselessly from the jungle at the point at which the apes had emerged but a moment before. Quickly the beast trotted across the clearing toward the anthropoids. Jane wondered at their apparent apathy, and a moment later her wonder turned to amazement as she saw the great cat come quite close to the apes, who, apparently entirely unconcerned by its presence, and squatting down in their midst, fell assiduously to the business of preening, which occupies most of the waking hours of the cat family. If the young woman was surprised by the sight of these natural enemies fraternizing, it was with emotions little short of fear for her own sanity that she presently saw a tall, muscular warrior enter the clearing and join the group of savage beasts assembled there. At first sight of the man, she had been positive that he would be torn to pieces, and she had half risen from her shelter, raising her rifle to her shoulder to do what she could to avert the man's terrible fate. Now she saw that he seemed actually conversing with the beast, issuing orders to them. Presently the entire company filed on across the clearing and disappeared into the jungle upon the opposite side. With a gasp of mingled incredulity and relief, Jane Clayton staggered to her feet and fled on away from the terrible horror that had just passed her, while half a mile behind her another individual, following the same trail as she, lay frozen with terror behind an anthill as the hideous band passed quite close to him. This one was Rokoff but he had recognized the members of the awful aggregation as allies of Tarzan of the Apes. No sooner, therefore, had the beast passed him than he rose and raced through the jungle as fast as he could go, in order that he might put as much distance as possible between himself and these frightful beasts. So it happened that as Jane Clayton came to the bank of the river, down which she hoped to float to the ocean and eventual rescue, Nicholas Rokoff was but a short distance in her rear. Upon the bank the girl saw a great dugout drawn halfway from the water and tied securely to a nearby tree. This, she felt, would solve the question of transportation to the sea, could she but launch the huge unwieldy craft. Unfastening the rope that had moored it to the tree, Jane pushed frantically upon the bow of the heavy canoe, but for all the results that were apparent she might as well have been attempting to shove the earth out of its orbit. 
She was about winded when it occurred to her to try working the dugout into the stream by loading the stern with ballast and then rocking the bow back and forth along the bank until the craft eventually worked itself into the river. There were no stones or rocks available, but along the shore she found quantities of driftwood deposited by the river at a slightly higher stage. These she gathered and piled far into the stern of the boat, until at last, to her immense relief, she saw the bow rise gently from the mud of the bank, and the stern drift slowly with the current until it again lodged a few feet farther downstream. Jane found that by running back and forth between the bow and the stern, she could alternately raise and lower each end of the boat as she shifted her weight from one end to the other, with the result that each time she leaped to the stern, the canoe moved a few inches farther into the river. As the success of her plan approached more closely to fruition, she became so wrapped in her efforts that she failed to note the figure of a man standing beneath a huge tree at the edge of the jungle from which he had just emerged. He watched her and her labors with a cruel and malicious grin upon his swarthy countenance. The boat at last became so nearly free of the retarding mud and of the bank that Jane felt positive that she could pull it off into deeper water with one of the paddles which lay in the bottom of the rude craft. With this end in view, she seized upon one of these implements, and had just plunged it into the river bottom close to the shore when her eyes happened to rise to the edge of the jungle. As her gaze fell upon the figure of the man, a little cry of terror rose to her lips. It was Rokoff. He was running toward her now, and shouting to her to wait or he would shoot. Though he was entirely unarmed, it was difficult to discover just how he intended making good his threat. Jane Clayton knew nothing of the various misfortunes that had befallen the Russian since he had escaped from his tent, so she believed that his followers must be close at hand. However, she had no intention of falling again into the man's clutches. She would rather die at once than that that should happen to her. Another minute and the boat would be free. Once in the current of the river, she would be beyond Rokoff's power to stop her, for there was no other boat upon the shore, and no man, certainly not the cowardly Rokoff, would dare to attempt to swim the crocodile-infested waters in an effort to overtake her. Rokoff, on his part, was bent more upon escape than aught else. He would gladly have forgone any designs he might have had upon Jane Clayton, would she but permit him to share this means of escape that she had discovered. He would promise anything if she would let him come aboard the dugout, but he did not think that it was necessary to do so. He saw that he could easily reach the bow of the boat before it cleared the shore, and then it would not be necessary to make promises of any sort. Not that Rokoff would have felt the slightest compunction in ignoring any promises he might have made the girl, but he disliked the idea of having to sue for favor with one who had so recently assaulted and escaped him. Already he was gloating over the days and nights of revenge that would be his while the heavy dugout drifted its slow way to the ocean. Jane Clayton, working furiously to shove the boat beyond his reach, suddenly realized that she was to be successful, for with a little lurch the dugout swung quickly into the current, just as the Russian reached out to place his hand upon the bow. His fingers did not miss their goal by a half-dozen inches. The girl almost collapsed with the reaction from the terrific mental, physical, and nervous strain under which she had been laboring for the past few minutes. But, thank heaven, at last she was safe. Even as she breathed a silent prayer of thanksgiving, she saw a sudden expression of triumph lighten the features of the cursing Russian, and, at the same instant, he dropped suddenly to the ground, grasping firmly upon something which wriggled through the mud toward the water. Jane Clayton crouched, wide-eyed and horror-stricken in the bottom of the boat as she realized at the last instant success had been turned to failure, and that she was indeed again in the power of the malignant Rokoff. For the thing the man had seen and grasped was the end of the trailing rope with which the dugout had been moored to the tree. End of chapter 14